Well, pull up a chair and set a spell here at Tales from SYL Ranch Live, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. And tonight on Tales from SYL Ranch, we have the Fandai Masters mini review of Doctor Who Season 11, Episode 6 Demons of the Punjab. Uh, let me see if I can get so I can see my chat. And let's see if I can show chat. Oh, come on. There must be a... Pardon me while I figure this out. There we go. Okay. So, to explain my show for somebody who might be coming, not coming in quite at the top of the hour, and for my new viewers, I do live reviews. Sometimes I do serious films and TV. Sometimes I do schlock, just for the kick of it. And sometimes I review movies and TV shows with a broad appeal, like Star Wars movies, Marvel movies, and, of course, tonight, Doctor Who. Now, I usually stick to a period from about 1900 to 1980, and that's because the period after 1980 is pretty well documented, what with all the great science fiction we got and all of the great technology that we got that allows us to do this documentation. But the period from 1900 to 1980 isn't very well documented, and it had a lot of great science fiction and a science fiction fandom. And so part of the reason I do my show is to document it. It's live, so I will take any and all questions, comments, and nasty remarks. I will respond to as many of my viewers as possible. You can tell me if I miss something, if I'm completely full of crap, or if I just happen to be amazingly hoopy frood, which is probably more likely. I also go into more depth than most reviewers. I don't just say whether I like the show or not. I go into the acting, direction, cinematography, some of the mechanics of making a film. And I can do this because a long time ago, in a galaxy very, very far away, I was once an actor. And I can speak with a little authority. Not as much authority as a modern working actor, and I never, ever want to give that impression. But I can speak with some authority. As they often say, those who can do, and those who can't teach. And I suspect the way I do my reviews is a lot more like teaching. Now, my Doctor Who reviews are what I call mini reviews. I don't go into anything like the depth that I usually do in my Monday reviews. In fact, today, due to the fact that I had quite a lot of yard work out today and my back is killing me, <laughs> I didn't have the same time to prep for a review as I often might have. And when I thought about it, I thought, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. These are supposed to be short mini-reviews, and they should be short. And so I will be relying more on audience interaction to increase or decrease the amount of time that I spend on the show. And to be honest, I will, starting tomorrow, be getting more of that viewer interaction, which I'll get into more in terms of why I'll be doing that at the tail end of this show. So as a non-spoiler review for this episode, I can probably say it's a good episode. It is not a stellar episode. It is better than what Chris Chibnall has done when writing on his own. And probably he should not be the head writer and maybe not the showrunner on this show. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that it does present an interesting uh, potential paradox or paradoxes that are never fully addressed in the show. And I'll talk about those in a minute. I can tell that this is a labor of love and that's okay but it is not a stellar episode. Frankly, I've been waiting since the season began to get a stellar episode, and we are still not getting it. And I think the show's ratings, which have suffered con considerably, are indicative of the fact that we are not getting stellar shows. And sadly, we can place the blame for this on only one man, and that would be Chris Chibnall. And I will talk about him a bit more in a moment. So, with that out of the way, I suppose I can issue myself a... Eh? Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. 
Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am the Fandai Master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me, and that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about half an hour early. Now this is not a boast, this is not a brag, this is sadly where you find yourself as a Fandai Master, having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see all this new stuff for the whole century that came before for, and it often interferes with your ability to enjoy things. And in point of fact, it has interfered with my ability to jo enjoy basically everything that has happened so far in this season of Doctor Who. So, keep in mind, I am about to spoil the whole freaking episode, so if you haven't watched it, don't watch beyond now. If you have watched it, well, we're going to assume from here on out that you did. Now, I'm not going to go into big synopsis for this one. I oftentimes do with my longer reviews because maybe somebody hasn't seen it. Uh, or maybe it's unfamiliar to them. But uh, I'm not going to do that now. We assume if you watched past the spoiler alert, you have seen the show. You know what the plot is. Now, when we talk about the plot, I usually like to talk about my cringe moments right off the bat. And there were some cringe moments in this one. Um, to begin with, there are some te potential time paradoxes that are not really talked about here. And it's worse than what the doctor says in terms of just Yaz maybe talking herself out of existence. If they change anything in this episode, then Yaz will not have existed. And this is a bad paradox, because if she doesn't exist, she would never become the Doctor's companion. And there would be no reason for them to have come to 1947 whatsoever. Now, this could be an infinite loop paradox, and that is one where you sort of go back and forth and back and forth. In this case, it could have been an, in, uh, an infinite loop paradox because... They came to India slash Pakistan when the border was going up at a very, very tumultuous time, and that's well mentioned here and shown. But suppose they do something to interfere that causes Yaz not to exist. Well, again, now they have no reason for being there in the first place. So the doctor never comes here. So the events then play out as they would if they had been not there whatsoever. But then we could say, okay, well, the problem is if they do that, then Yaz does exist. And so we go back through this infinite loop. And that is problematic. However, in this particular case, it appears that much like the episode Rosa with Rosa Parks, they are in a predestination paradox. That is, things could not have happened the way they did if they had not gone back in time. The deal is, the difference between the Rosa Parks one was where they had to sort of manipulate events so that they came about and they were part of that. Here, they have to do as little as humanly possible. They are there. The doctor is officiating at a wedding. And, you know, Yaz is helping out from time to time, so are Graham and Ryan, but they still have to do as little as possible, as it turns out, in the episode. And things come up in terms of my mind, you know, they're there, and particularly with doc, the doctor officiating at the marriage, and that must have meant that they were part of those events. Yet at the same time, wouldn't Yaz's grandmother, if she ever sees the doctor, recognize this blonde, very strangely dressed woman for the ninth period of 1970s officiating at her wedding. She might not remember Yaz, but she might well remember the doctor. But again, they have to be involved in this for things to turn out the way that they did. The difference is they have to do as little as humanly possible. Now, I also like to talk about great moments. I thought that this episode had a lot of heart. You could tell that, much like the episode Rosa, this was a labor of love for writer Vinay Patel. Speaking of whom, talking about the writer of the show, <clears throat> it was Vinay Patel. This, again, was clearly a labor of love for him, much like Rosa was a labor of love for Mallory Black Blackman. 
And Patel wants to tell a personal story that is set in a rather horrific period for both India and Pakistan and set the stage for much of what we see today. India and Pakistan have since then been involved in some level of conflict ever since. And in terms of setting this show in that period and doing a personal show, a personal tale about someone involved in that, he succeeded. And I don't want to take that away from him. He did succeed in doing this as what we call a one and done episode. You know, we do one thing, we're finished there, we go on. Kind of like how the original Star Trek was. It was a one and done. We do one thing, move on to the next, and probably never see anything about that last one ever again. And he succeeded in this, and I don't ever want to take that away from him. It was, however, something of not a stellar episode, which is what I've been looking for this whole time. We have not yet seen a really stellar episode in this series, and that is going to be a problem I'll talk about in a minute. Now, in terms of issues and the reason that this is not a stellar episode is because it is not his fault. This is the fault of Chris Chibnall, the head writer on the show and a showrunner this year. What have been missing in stories so far this year is good character development for all the companions. And I've talked about in previous episodes that this may be problematic for them, and I think it's playing out that way. Sadly, as the Fandai master and the fandom being strong with me and having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years worth of science fiction, it's all predictable, and I have seen that. Now, what we really need here is what we've had prior to this. We need a show, because most people don't realize that Doctor Who since 2005 has mostly been about the companions. It is about the companions and how the adventures go on, change them as people. When we have only one companion to deal with, that's pretty easy to do. You can do an entire 10 episodes, 12 episodes, 10 in this case of this season, and do good character development for all of them. But when we have three and only 10 episodes, it's about impossible to do, and that is a problem. And we need to see more character development being focused on those companions. What we're also missing here are season-long arcs. Arcs that will ask you things in certain episodes. They'll ask questions in certain episodes, and then they'll go another episode and maybe answer some of those episodes from previous ones, but then build up and ask their own questions again. And so by the time we get to the end of the season, well, then we have a big climax. We have two or three episodes where we build up to something really big, where all of this stuff that we've been seeing so far pays off in a nice way, ties it up in a nice bow, and we get to see that. That's how Doctor Who since 2005 has operated, and it has worked very, very well. Now, the fact that we're not seeing this is all on Chris Chibnall. Now, I, I very much like, I've said in previous episodes, I very much like that he's taken the Doctor much lighter and must much faster paced than in the Capaldi era. My fear is that ultimately down the line, we may think of the Capaldi era the same way that we do the, the Colin Baker era which is something that we just don't remember that well. I mean, it, you know, it's not on Capaldi. It's not his fault. It's the fault of the then showrunner and head, head, chief, head writer, um, Stephen Moffat, who jumped the shark right after Day of the Doctor. That was the pinnacle of what he could do, and it went downhill from there. I do like that Chibnall has now given us a faster-paced Doctor like we've been expecting to see since the 2005 series started, and he has made it much lighter. Um, the problem is, Stephen Moffat wrote what is, I think, almost inarguably the best Doctor Who episode ever written. The best. No one will ever, ever top that one. It's impossible. So he hit the pinnacle with the Day of the Doctor. There wasn't much for him left to do. Where do you go from the top? Where do you go from having written the best episode in Doctor Who history? Where do you go from that? Well, he did what most artists do when they run out of ideas, when they've hit that pinnacle and there's nowhere else to go. He went dark. 
and people don't want to watch the doctor be dark. There should be a big, big sign in the writer's room here that says, when you take the doctor too dark, people stop watching. Nobody wants to see Clara Oswald die in a horrible fashion. Nobody wants to see Bill with a freaking hole in her chest turned into a Cyberman and then only rescued at the end by a deus ex machina that seemed to completely come out of nowhere. But Chris Chibnall is missing the bigger picture. He is not right for the showrunner and head writer for this show. And I think the dip in ratings, which has been significant, is showing this. The problem is, Doctor Who has been dipping in the ratings since the Capaldi era. It was pretty high on the first episode, and then it's been slowly dropping off ever since. And I think if we don't do something really fast and fairly soon, this show could end up being canceled just as it was after uh, the McCoy era, the seventh Doctor. I think that the BBC needs to get rid of Chibnall at the end of this season and hire someone more like Stephen Moffat before he jumped the shark after the day of the Doctor. I think they probably have one season more to get this right. Or after the next one, Doctor Who could well be cancelled. So that's that. That's talking about what we don't have here that we probably need to have here and I have not been seeing here. So we got into performances here. Now I'm not going to go through individual actors except with a couple of exceptions. I think all of their performances are fine. Nobody does a bad performance. But by the same token, nobody jumps out at me as being really amazing here. I mean, they're doing a good performance for what the material has. They're totally believable. I completely buy them in terms of what they're doing. But there is nobody jumping out at me that says, oh, okay, there's somebody who should be winning awards, you know. Uh, they're fine actors. Don't get me wrong. They're fine actors. And, you know, I, I, hate, I hate giving even mediocre um, reviews to actors because I used to be one. And I know how it feels to get that kind of, uh, you know, sort of not so great review. But they're, they're doing fine. They're doing fine. I totally bought them. I totally bought them. Everything's fine. No problem with these guys. I'm seeing some either buffering or dropped frames. I hate when I see buffering or dropped frames. Hopefully it won't last very long. Anyway, in terms of other characters, in terms of the specific characters that I uh, do like, I continue to like Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. Now, as ladies, ladies, I'm telling you, now it's my turn. I have heard you guys swooning over Matt Smith and David Tennant and John Berriman, and now the shoe is on the other foot because uh, Jody Whitaker is um, old enough that I can now consider her hot. <laughs> um, I think she makes a great doctor, and she's the first one. Ladies, the shoe is on the other foot where I can say I think she's really hot and I like her very much. This may not be politically correct, but this is not a politically correct show. So, deal. Shoes on the other foot. I get to do it now. It's my go. <laughs> I also continue to like Graham. He seems to be the wisest among one among the bunch. Uh, when discussing with Yaz why her grandmother never told her any of the things that they're now seeing and experiencing, he has the right answers. And I know they're the right answers because they're answers that come with age. They're the kind of answers that I would give. So that's part of why I identify him. The other one is his age. It is the first time that I can see myself as a companion in the TARDIS. That's never happened before because all the companions have been very young. But by having an older companion, and especially a man, and one that keeps saying things that I totally could see coming out of my own mouth, I have to say, you know, this is why I can, I can really um, identify this character and why I feel very uh, good things about him.
And again, it's not really happened to me before. In, in the past, the best I could do was sort of relate to the doctor. But by the same token, I am not a nigh immortal, super, super intelligent alien. So what do you do? And I'm seeing what looks like more dropped frames. I, gee, I hope that doesn't keep going. Getting into aspects of the production, this was directed this time around by Jamie Childs. Uh, it's fine direction. Um, there is nothing here that's particularly memorable, you know, in terms of jumping out at me and saying, wow, this is really amazing directing. Other than I have to say, I am always so fracking glad when we see location shooting. And we got good location shooting here. Love that, love that, love that. Might get much more than when I'm seeing stuff that is on a sound stage and with green screens. I way, way much prefer when we get them out into the field and we're doing some level of, uh, you know, on location shooting. So, yay, glad for that. Awesome, glad to hear it. So, We'll look over at my control panel here for a second and see if it's seeing anything new. Not really. It's seeing stuff about my video bit rate, but it's been telling me wrong things about that for a while. So, all right. Well, we'll deal. Cinematography is again by Simon Chapman. I find the cinematography fine. Now, in a really good production, whether it's television or motion pictures, you have some give and take back and forth, sort of a more collaboration that happens between the cinematographer and the director. The director can say, hey, I'd like to do this shot over here. And the cinematographer can say, hey, that's, that's a great idea. What if we tweak it just a little bit? We maybe change a little the angles of lighting and it'll be more dramatic. And the director will say, oh, good, yeah, that's perfect. That's wonderful. Uh, let's do that. I have no idea whether that's happening here or not. Not the slightest fracking clue. So I can say about the cinematography, you always have, not knowing that, you always have to rely on the basics. A good cinematographer will give you two things. You can see what you're supposed to see and you know what you're supposed to look at. And we can certainly see that here. Regardless of whatever else may have been going on behind the scenes, we could see what we could see. We knew what we were supposed to look at. That was good. Visual effects by Martin Weston, uh, Martin Western again. Um, they are fine. I'm not sure there are a ton of visual effects here. The trans uh, uh, special effects, certainly visual effects involved there. And that was interesting. Uh, you know, transmats are something that go back to Doctor Who classic way, way, way back. They never called them teleport or anything like that. They always called them transmats. And the transmat effect has changed over the years, but that's it's totally different than anything else we've seen in transmat. It's very different from anything else we've seen in like Star Trek or something like that. And that's fine. Different transmats can operate in different ways. That's not a problem. Not that this one was really effective. If you're going for this whole, you know, aliens who look kind of like demons thing, then that transmat effect is really cool because they just whoosh and they're gone suddenly. Um, so that was good. I like that transmat effect. Now, production design, also, again, by R. Will Jones, which is fine production design. It is an appropriate period piece. Now, I have to plead ignorance on this one. I have no way to judge how accurate uh, the settings that he's going for here are. I just don't know enough about that period or that area, other than to know that it has been a hotbed ever since the partitioning happened with um, Pakistan and India. It's probably one of the worst things that could have happened to them in terms of historically, in terms of what's happened. So I have no real way to judge, you know, whether this is historically accurate. But in the past, Arwell Jones has seemed to know what he was doing. I mean, when he did it with Rosa, I, you know, as an American, I certainly believed, even though they were shooting in South Africa, as an American, I certainly believed that they were um, in Alabama. I had no problem with that. So we'll assume, just off the top, we assume that he's a good enough guy to know when he's, he's doing his research and he's getting these sets and stuff. 
right. We'll assume that they are historically accurate, or at least generally so. And if so, in that respect, he did a very good job. We've got sets and set design here that looks perfectly rational for the period. Makeup is again by Amy Riley, as has been for the entire series so far. Um, I'm not sure how much of the aliens is makeup or costume design. It was probably some of both. And it was effective either way. And you, what you always hope in something like this in a good production is there is back and forth when that happens. You have a little back and forth between the costumer and the makeup artist so that you can say, okay, you know, maybe we could do this, maybe we could do that, maybe a little better here. And hopefully some of that was going on here. I don't know. In terms of other makeup, characters' makeup, it was mostly functional. It was how these people would have looked at that time and that place, you know, hairstyles, things like that. Uh, companions continue to be basically functional and basically the same throughout. So uh, no problem there. Uh, you can tell, and it's particularly difficult. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, you know, take this away from them. It's difficult to do makeup in 1080p. Look at me. I'm coming to you in 720p. And you can see the lines. You can see the skin imperfections. I haven't shaved today. That may be showing up. If I were in 1080p and without makeup, because I don't use makeup on the show, um, it would be much, much worse. <laughs> and if you're watching, you know, the characters here, the doctor and stuff, the worst thing that you can have happen is to look like the makeup is caked on. And that's really easy in 1080p. Uh, you know, one of the things that 1080p has made us do is come up with actors who are just damned perfect in their faces. Uh, because giving them makeup in 1080p, it starts to look bad. So, uh, you know, everything looked fine here. Um, Close-ups looked fine. Everything was cool. No problem with anything going on here in the makeup. Costume designs, again, this, uh, this uh, episode, like the remainder of the series, series so far, is by Ray Holman, and he does good costuming. Again, I have no way of knowing, because I'm ignorant of the time period and the place, how much of these costumes are historically accurate. But we assume, let's just assume, that Ray Holman knows what he's doing and has researched this stuff and so knows how to make costumes that are period costumes that make sense in the given time and the given place. One little detail I noted, uh, it's something I've talked about in prior reviews. I noticed that the doctor's shirt is looser than it had been before. Prior to this, at least this is the first time I've noticed it, but when in the beginning, her shirt was absolutely skin tight with, you know, stripes across that are designed to do one thing. And it's consistent with the rest of the costume, which is also designed to do one thing. And that is to minimize um, Jodie Whittaker's uh, body, to minimize her breasts, to minimize her hips and her figure. And there's a reason for that. Yeah, Jodie Whittaker, hey, she's my age. It's cool. She's hot. <laughs> she's a very beautiful woman. And so for Jodie Whittaker, for her to be in Doctor Who, looking as attractive as she would on, say, a red carpet, and she's done nude scenes. You can find those. If they were to do costuming here that did not do all this minimization, it leaves the BBC in a difficult position. It leaves them in the position of their mothers of 13-year-old kids may call the BBC to complain that their 13-year-old boy is whacking to the doctor. And that is the very last thing that the BBC wants to have to deal with. It is one thing to be doing it with pictures of her on the runway. It is a whole other thing to be doing it to the doctor herself. And so her costume is rather specifically designed to sort of defeminize her, to make her body less obvious. But in this, I happen to notice that the shirt she's wearing is much looser than it had been in the past. It is not doing the same level of minimization that it was in the first few episodes. Now, maybe they just decided that that incredibly tight thing did not work well in actual production, and so they got rid of it. Or it might be that Jodie Whittaker herself found it hard to deal with. You know, wearing something that tight 
all day long is not a whole hell of a lot of fun. So they loosened it. Either way, I think it's better now. It's better now. And I don't think you run the risk still of little Johnny whacking to the doctor. I think this works fine. Um, it does show a little bit more. Uh, let's outlines happen. But it's still not the same as pictures you can see of her on red carpets and stuff like that. Music, again, by Sagun Akinola. He does another very good job. It is all very appropriate music. Now, I don't know how much of this sort of Eastern motif music that he does throughout the entire episode is accurate. I am not familiar enough with that. That type of music, despite the fact I'm a huge audiophile and I love um, movie and TV soundtracks, have an enormous collection of them sitting on this very computer that I'm using. I have gigabytes worth of them. Despite the fact that I am a huge soundtrack fan, I have never been a huge fan of that type of music. It's just, it's like, you know, metal rock, heavy metal rock. Just ain't my thing. You know, so I don't know. I don't know whether or not this is actually, you know, accurately showing us, giving us music that really is like that music. I don't know. It's certainly trying. So I don't know whether or not it's Eastern, uh, just Eastern sounding or if it's based on maybe motifs that actually happen in Eastern music. I just don't know. I have to claim ignorance on this one. I would have to say that regardless, it was certainly very appropriate. And, uh, you know, I, I like the fact that, as with Rosa, uh, he let this music run through the end credits. It made the whole episode a little bit more powerful just because the music keeps going. And so that was nice. I think, you know, we could wind up seeing that as a theme throughout uh, while he's doing music, that they run you know, if they're doing period pieces, they may run the period music through the end credits. Now, it did bother me when we got to the uh, trailer for next week on it because that did not seem appropriate. I understand why they did it, you know, to not break the music up. It's one of those deals where if they were to fade to black right after that, right after the end credits roll and then fade up into the trailer. It would give them an opportunity to change the music to, you know, regular Doctor Who stuff that maybe fits a little more uh, with, uh, you know, sort of a trailer. But since they don't do that, they just go from the end of the visuals for the credits and straight into the trailer. Well, there's no opportunity to do it. Regardless, I like that he did that. I like that he let it run through the end credits. I thought it made a more powerful episode. Despite it not being a stellar episode, despite not having yet seen a stellar episode, it did make it a more powerful episode. So there's that. Now, that stuff about the episode out of the way, I want to talk in general about the social justice warrior-ness or PC politically correctness of Doctor Who with a woman as the Doctor. I have seen a lot of YouTubers and apparently some viewers who complain about this being too politically correct. I have to tell you, I don't see it. I think most of these people are getting worked up over nothing. The problem really isn't politically correctness, because if it was, oh God, would I be screaming about it? You know, watch me talk about The Last Jedi, and I will scream at you about it, about how it's all PC and social justice warrior, and it's stupid, and I hate it. And I'm critical of that stuff anyway. Sometimes I do sociopolitical commentary at the end of my Monday reviews. And I'm very, 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 very critical of that. And if that was happening here, I think I would notice and I would start screaming about it. That is not in my mind the problem. The problem is that we have yet to see arcs with individual stories that answer questions, raise new ones, and to culminate at the end with a nice big season closer that ties it all up in a nice bow for us. And the reason, again, is Chris Chibnall. He does not know how to plot these things. I think the BBC needs to let him go at the end of this season and let someone else do it. Because without someone who has this long-term, broad plan, it falls flat. 
You know, one of the interesting things about before he jumped the shark, what Stephen Moffat was doing with Matt Smith, he had an incredibly long story arc involved in that. Just an incredibly long one. Um, and if you think about what happened with Matt Smith as the doctor, because Moffat knew what he was going to do the entire time, had this whole arc figured out, because he knew that, um, Matt Smith's doctor did not have a lot of control over his own destiny. He was tied up constantly with River Song and meeting her in the wrong order and various plot stuff that all tied up rather nicely at the season, you know, when he got to uh, the name of the doctor. Or, uh, yeah, I think it was, no, not the name of the doctor, the time of the doctor. When he got to time of the doctor, it had all tied up in a very nice bow. And you could see that he had this huge arc that extended for, for uh, Matt Smith right from the beginning to the end of his tenure and a little bit beyond into Capaldi's era. But he had this huge story arc. And as a result, because he was constantly involved in this time travel thing going on with River Song, he never really had control of his own destiny. He really didn't have much control over his own destiny. He had to keep doing these things that would lead to various outcomes because they had to for River Song's whole arc to play out. They knew, they didn't know what was going to happen, but they knew things were going to happen and they had to happen in a certain order. You know, it's the sort of deal where if I were a time traveler, right? And I got finished with all that. I got done, and River Song is finally gone and out of my life. I'd be like, I am never getting involved with romantically with anybody else ever again. And if I take on companions, I'm going to take them on in terms of the time stream as we both experience it. Otherwise, you do as Matt Smith's doctor. If you really think about it, you wind up in a situation where you don't have control over your own destiny. You must do certain things so that they will continue to play out and things don't get screwed up for you. And the fact that Moffat, before he jumped the shark, with the best Doctor Who episode ever, I think you can... I don't think there's another argument to be made that it is not the best Doctor Who episode. It is the best one ever made. And that's why with him, when he got to the top... There's nowhere to go but down. So he thought, let's go dark. Let's show a companion with a hole in their chest. Let's kill a companion in a rather frightening and horrible way. And in fact, if you look at Capaldi's era, everything is done in dark filters, dark places. Uh, the whole production just went dark. And taking it away from that is a good thing. By the same token, they have someone here who does not appear to understand the notion of having series-long and even character-long arcs from beginning to end. And because of that, and because we have too many companions for too uh, little amount of time, we're not seeing stellar episodes. Nothing has been stellar yet. Nothing has been surprising me. As a fan die master, I have been watching it all and pretty much guessing exactly where it's going to go the entire time. They need somebody who can surprise me. Moffat, before he jumped the shark, could surprise me consistently. It would leave me with questions. It would leave me wondering, what the hell? How are they going to do this? How are they going to get through this episode? And how is it going to work? And that's hard to do with me. That's really hard to do. And it's not happening here now. It has not happened yet so far in this season. And we're seeing good episodes, but not stellar ones. So toward the end of the review, I usually ask... Is it any good? Well, it's fine. It is not stellar. And it does lack these arcs that have been present in, uh, for Doctor Who post-2005. And that's a problem. And I think they need to let Chibnall go at the end of this season and find someone who can come up with these grand arcs and give us these stories that have arcs between the stories, that have arcs over a season, that have arcs over the entire Doctor's tenure. That's the sort of thing we need to see. And someone who can surprise the Fandai Master again. It is simply not as good 
as it has been. It has nothing to do with political correctness. It has to do with the fact that these stories, I don't find them boring at all. I do not find them boring. I have not been bored. It's simply been predictable. It's been predictable. I can see the end coming. I don't know about everybody else. But as the Van Dye Master, I have seen every single one of these coming. And I'm afraid I'm going to keep seeing them. And I'm afraid all we're going to see is these sort of one-and-done shows. And uh, we shouldn't be seeing that in Doctor Who. We need to have something bigger going on. Now, you know, that's what I think about the episode. It is fine. It is not a stellar episode, but we have yet to see one. It is an episode with some heart. It is an episode that does, to some extent, tug on your heartstrings. It's an episode that does not get into some of the potential time paradoxes and the fact that wouldn't Yaz's grandmother recognize the doctor if she ever saw her because she's so distinctive in terms of what she wears. Um, but, you know, it's not a bad episode. I'd say go ahead and watch it. Just know going in that like the rest of the episodes so far this season, it is not a stellar episode. It is a good episode. It is not a stellar episode. Episode. That's the review. The other thing I want to talk about is I have spent a week or so here on Periscope and I'm abandoning it. I'm going to move back to YouTube. And if you want to get to my YouTube channel, um, sadly it has a horrifyingly long URL. There's no way to make it any shorter. So uh, what I've done, until I can get 1,000 subs, if I can get 1,000 subs, or 100 subs, I'm sorry, 100 subs, if I can get up to 100 subs on YouTube, then I can get a decent URL. But as problematic as YouTube has been in the past, <laughs> they were problematic just today. I've been in the process of restoring all 300-plus videos that have been deleted previous to this. I will probably be doing that one a day quietly, one a day. I will probably start out with the Star Trek Continues reviews because I think those are really good examples of what I can do when I'm reviewing a show. And at the same time, uh, I really like <laughs> Star Trek Continues. I was just watching the last two episodes again last night, and the, those are amazing episodes. If you haven't watched Star Trek Continues, do. I have a playlist for it on my YouTube channel. Have a look there. They're all on there in order. And when you get to those final episodes, you'll see, as I mentioned in my reviews of the time, they have successfully managed to create an arc for the entire original series and gave us at the end the season series finale that we never saw, sadly, in Star Trek. So it's a great series, and I'm going to try starting to put my reviews up about one a day for a long time. It'll take me about a year to get all of them back up. I'm going to do it very slowly so that I don't get killed like the last time for no reason that I can think of. But I'm moving back not just for that. There are pain in my behind and I would prefer to have to use it, but I'm finding now that I probably need to move back. And I'll still be rebuilding my audience due to YouTube's scurrilous copyright assignments because they did it to me twice, totally scurriously, scurriously, and I almost dare not uh, try to do anything about it. I am going to try to be more careful going forward to not have things like trailers, because they'd kill me on trailers all the time. Sometimes, like they're killing me, uh, they gave me an assignment, a copyright reassignment, on my uh, 1938 broadcast, live vlogcast of the War of the Worlds. The thing's in the public domain. But it turns out there is like one line from that thing that appears in someone's song somewhere. And they did me a copyright reassignment over that. One fracking line that is about three seconds long. That's totally scurrilous. But I don't dare fight them. I don't dare fight them. I don't want to call attention to myself. So, starting tomorrow, Monday, November, 20, November 12th, I'm going to drop a video. Well, I may drop a video tomorrow. I don't know. Current events. If you watch my show for any length of time, you'll discover that I have been worried for some time 
that events in this country, in the United States, are heading us toward an actual civil war. And I know how to prevent it. It's not the way you think at all, but I know how to prevent it. And I think it may be time for me to start dropping those videos, to put them down, explaining what needs to happen, and agitating for it. And I don't know if I'll do it tomorrow. I don't know. I have been kicking this around for a long time, and I have a very specific set of speeches that I'm going to make. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it eventually. And if I do that, I need eyes. And I cannot get the eyes here on Periscope. It's impossible. Just look right now, 45 minutes in the review, I have anybody, not a single viewer, and no one is talking to me. YouTube, that's totally different. I always get feedback from the viewers. And I need the eyes on these particular videos that I am currently thinking very, very damned hard about dropping. Because I think we're headed toward a civil war in the United States. And I know how to stop it. So, I will be moving again tomorrow night back to YouTube. Follow this URL that you can see below at tinyurl.com slash tales-syl ranch, and that will take you straight there. So, I will be on YouTube again tomorrow at this time, and uh, I guess at this point, I might do a little bit of ad copy. Now, viewers who may not know me very well, I try to do my ad copy in the... Um, spirit of Ernie Anderson, who was one of those voiceover guys that you heard. He was the voiceover guy for, uh, you know, movies and TV shows on NBC for the longest, ABC, I'm sorry, ABC for the longest time. If you grew up when I did, you would recognize Ernie Anderson's voice, even if you don't know who he is. So, badly imitating Ernie Anderson. <clears throat> Next Sunday, on Tales from S.Y.L. Ranch, a mysterious message arrives, leading the Doctor and her companions to investigate to the warehouse moon of the galaxy's largest retailer. That's next Sunday, on the Fandai Master's review of Doctor Who Season 11, Episode 7, Kerblam! Then, tomorrow... In the distant future, an astronaut, Barbarella, has been assigned to the pre by the President of the Earth to rescue renowned scientist Durand Durand, who vanished in the Tau Ceti region. Now, Barbarella crash lands on the frozen planet Lithion and must brave a dangerous journey to save the Earth. That's tomorrow on the Fandai Master's 50th anniversary review of Barbarella. And, of course, Tales from S.Y.L. Ranch is live here on Sundays and Mondays on YouTube starting tomorrow in North America at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Pacific. And if you're working off of UTC, that'll be 2 a.m. the following morning. Now, in terms of upcoming reviews, because I've got some scheduled, I have a bunch of them scheduled already for next year, for 2019, but for the next few weeks, getting us into the next year. Every Sunday, of course, for the next four weeks until the series ends, I will be doing Doctor Who mini-reviews like this one. And after Barbarella, tomorrow night, I will be doing, on November 19th, just in time for the holidays, I will be doing a review of the Star Wars Holiday Special Abridged 45-Minute watchable edition. Let me throw out my promo here. I neglected to do that. And I'll be doing the 45-minute watchable edition because if you have ever seen it or even heard about it, you know that the Star Wars Holiday Special is a nightmare. There's only three reasons that you should ever watch that. One, if you're a Star Wars purist, if you want to say, I have watched everything that ever had the Star Wars name on it, okay, then you can watch it. Just be aware, it sucks. Or two, you could be a masochist who enjoys having this stuff thrown at you. Or three, you could be a psychotic, because I think if you were a psychotic, the whole thing would make a hell of a lot more sense. But we're not going to do that. I will have a link in the video tomorrow to take you to the Star Wars Holiday Special Abridged 45-Minute Watchable Edition. Now, what we're going to do is show you how editing 
can take an otherwise miserable and incomprehensible piece of crap and turn it into something that is at least coherent. The Star Wars Holiday Special will never, ever, ever be good. However, good editing, just editing, editing will turn it into something that is at least coherent. And so that's what we're going to go over. Then, on November 26th, Kuwaiter Mass 2. I am working my way up to something very specific. From 1955, the BBC TV production. December 3rd, The Fly, starring Vincent Price, hits its 60th anniversary. And then, on December 10th, the one that I have been off and on working on L for months. Superman, the movie, which is its 40th anniversary. It is... As far as I'm concerned, the best Superman movie made to date and will probably be the best Superman movie that is ever made. December 17th, we finally get up to what I've been working up to on the Quatermass series, Quatermass and the Pit, as it hits its 60th anniversary. The reason I'm doing that one is because when I was very young, and I don't know how old, I saw Hammer Films' uh, adaptation of that. And the aliens in that one completely freaked me out and stick with me to this day as being something I thought was just uneasy and terrifying. And I had I actually had bad dreams about it. That almost never happens with science fiction. But in that case, I actually had bad dreams about it. So we're going to do the BBC TV series, which fortunately survives in its entirety. So we're very lucky. No, I'm sorry, December, December 24th, I am dark for Christmas, but I'm back on December 26th for the Doctor Who Christmas Special 2018. Depending on how things go with my family, I might just go crazy and do that one on the 25th. We shall see. December 31st, well, we get from 8 p.m. to Central Time, 8 p.m. to midnight, rather, Central Time, and in all American time zones starting at 8 p.m. Central we will be celebrating the new year with the Fandai Masters. So remember, bring your sham pipple. And we will also be reviewing The Orville, Season 2, Episode 1, Primal Urges. Getting into next year, December 7th on 2019, the 70th anniversary review of Son of Frankenstein. And then on January 14th, we will celebrate the Fandai Master's birthday with the 100th anniversary review, the centennial review of the film The Mistress of the World. And that's what we've got going into the first couple of weeks of next year. I have a whole bunch of other stuff that's scheduled throughout the year already, and it'll grow some more. And if you go to my website, which I'll have up in a second, if you go to my website, you can see the entire schedule as I have it currently set out. So you can take a look and see exactly what's going on with it. So at this point, I guess I might ask something like this. Say, pardon me, but could you help out a fellow American who's down on his luck? So, if you like what I'm doing, please go over to my YouTube channel, tinyurl.com slash tales-syl-ranch. You can see it. It is a scrolling third very um, consistently on my lower third right down there. And uh, you can follow me there. You can uh, subscribe to my channel, follow me on Twitter, and tell all your friends, family, neighbors, and pets, and livestock to do the same. And you can visit my uh, website, which I have moved. I have moved it over to my primary website, the one that I've had now for coming up on 25, maybe 30 years, um, which is www.wrstone.com. That has now been reworked to be the website for this show. And you can sort of remember it in as much as my full name is William Robert Stone III, hence wrstone.com. So go over there. There's lots of information. You will see how to uh, support me. There's various different links that will help you to do that um, because obviously I'm user supported. <laughs> I'm doing this as a hobby at the most point at this point, and I'm still building back my audience because YouTube fracked me. And so, if you go over there, you'll be able to see recent shows that I've done. You'll be able to see upcoming shows that I'm going to do because I schedule them. So you can see the video links right there. You can see the videos embedded, even for upcoming shows. I do them scheduled. 
And you can visit me there for ways to support me with tip, PayPal chip jar. My Patreon link is there. I have an Amazon wish list that includes a number of things that would make things better in terms of my production values here. But the biggest thing, the biggest thing, there is a very nice laptop on there. I operate off of equipment that is circa 2004. If I got that laptop, all of my technical problems disappear. I can probably come to you at at least a frame rate of 30 frames per second, which I can't do right now because my machine is not capable of encoding and then sending it out. That computer would solve all my problems instantly. And if you were so crazy as to buy that thing for me outright, because it's like 1500 bucks, it's a good graphics computer. It'll do everything I need. If you're crazy enough to buy that sucker for me outright, well, you get to become the program director on this show. You get to tell me what to review, when to review it, what nights to review it, and how long to review it. You don't get to tell me whether I liked it or not, but you do get to tell me everything else. If you buy that sucker, you are my program director. And again, you can see this all on my website at www.wrstone.com. Lastly, I have to thank my visitors, my viewers who have contributed and are continuing to contribute to me. This means a lot to me. First off, anything that you contribute to me just is going to accrue until such time as I can buy that laptop. So that's a big deal for me on a number of levels. But the other is, as I mentioned, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was once a fairly unsuccessful actor. And coming to you like this requires a certain level of presentation. It's not acting. There are YouTubers out there who are acting. What you see on them is not real. They are portraying a character. I am not doing that. I am myself. I am telling you what I think. I am being me. It is sort of, I have notes for what I do. I have notes that are sitting up here as close to having a uh, teleprompter as I possibly can. I have notes, but you're still seeing me largely extemporizing. I'm just making some of this stuff up as I go along. The notes help, but I'm making it up. It's me. I'm doing everything. It's real. What you're seeing here in terms of presentation is things like the green screen, how I'm doing lighting, this costume I'm wearing, because trust me, nobody where I live actually wears this. This is just the image that I'm trying to project. That part of it is a little bit of performance. So to have someone pay me, not only for my opinions, but also as something of an actor still, means a great deal to me. It means a great deal to me. Um, I, I was never a successful actor, and I don't expect to necessarily be one here, but uh, it means a lot to me that anybody would pay me, both for my opinions and for the fact that I am doing some level of performance in order to do this. So, In the immortal words of Elvis Presley, uh, those of you who have been contributing to me, Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And so I would guess that is all the time that we have today, boys and girls. So tune in tomorrow for my review as the uh, 50th anniversary review of Barbarella. And until then, this is Tales from SYL Ranch, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.